the odds of me winning were slim and none. Slim to none. Those are the odds Lake Speed gave himself for the 1978 CIK Karting World Championships in the top Supreme class held at Le Mans. It probably had a little something to do with the fact that there were two drivers racing at the title event that would be full-time Formula 1 racers within a handful of years. But against all odds, he'd take the title and fly the Stars and Stripes at the World Championships. It's been 37 years since the American flag was flown at the Karting World Championship, and it was thought by many that it might not be raised again. The path to becoming a full-time Formula 1 driver has more twists and turns than the S's of a Grand Prix circuit, more ups and downs than the racing line of the trickiest of sectors on the most demanding of circuits. First, you must win, and often, and at the highest level. But there's more than just taking titles. You need allies, you need support, and at a certain point, it's going to be a 100% necessity. The idea is that wins equals exposure, and exposure equals backing. And karting is the best place to start, and Formula One is a game of margins, after all, where tenths of a second is the difference in careers you remember and the ones you've never heard of. Here's a list of names of drivers that I'd wager you are familiar with. Of this assorted list of single-seater talents, there's one common denominator linking them all together, and that's the FIA Karting World Championship. One of the most tried and true key metrics that acts as a reliable benchmark for predicting success in the top levels of single-seater racing is success at the karting level. And you don't have to take it from me, just maybe Ron Dennis knows what he's talking about a little bit. By and large, all the great Grand Prix drivers are, are, are from karting. It, it's the right place to start. He has done a pretty good job of identifying talent in the past from karting. And of these champions that have come from one of at least three of the sanctioned levels, you'll likely notice that all but one has raced in Formula One with relative degrees of success. The odd man out is Logan Sargent, there at the top. His 2015 FIA World Championship karting title would be the first time an American would pull this feat off since Lake Speed did it in 1978. And while Lake would prefer NASCAR to other series, and you're a liar if you'd say he wouldn't drive this car, his son Scott would hook up a ride with Red Bull through their interesting, let's call it, driver search program. My friend Josh actually tells this story really well. Check it out later. But the point is, even when Lake won the title, he went back to NASCAR because, well, that's what he knew. The Mississippi boy had no interest in racing in Europe. And I'm cribbing his lines, by the way. Those aren't mine. He said, I can't believe it. A dead gum tourist has won the world championship. <laughs> and I'm not sure who out there is paying close enough attention, but did you notice those dates? It was of no consequence to speed that the very same year that the second American ever in the history of Formula One had taken a title, he would go on to be the first American to ever win the Karting World title. And yet, Mario's win had no resounding impact on his plans for the future of his motorsport career. So ironically, this isn't a story about an American driver, per se. It's a story about a dream, a story about defying the odds, and the pursuit of the champagne shower. The cork pops all the same regardless of the country you come from. So, welcome to Sergeant's Story. The chicken flag beats ready. The world champion is Logan Sargent. He has won the world championship for 2015. Racing carts is one thing, but the progression to cars, well, that doesn't always go well. And being an unbacked driver without any major motorsport backing or support, that makes that transition all the more difficult. His UAE F4 performance was a great proof of concept that helped him graduate to British F4 for the 2017 season. This would be Sargent's first real soiree into the type of drivers he'd be competing against in perpetuity. And that British F4 season was stacked has many names that are vying for championships all across motorsports today. And that season was won by none other than Jamie Caroline, who still today is adding hardware to his trophy case after taking the British GT4 title in the 2020 season. And rewinding back to that season, he happened to be on his redemption tour, having lost the previous season's F4 title. But just because he was the returning Grizzly vet didn't mean the younger drivers of Sargent and Oscar Piastri were backing down. In the ensuing battle that would come from the Piastri and Sargent showdown, this would not be the last electrifying shootout for supremacy. Keep that one in the back of your mind. And the three of them showed outstanding class as it was an incredible season for all of them. Piastri would take pole champion honors while Sargent would find himself most consistently in the top five at a 77% rate. Caroline would prove to be the more dominant of the drivers and he'd take a lion's share of the wins that season. He would put on a clinic throughout the first four rounds in particular, but all of them would be incredibly consistent. Of the combined 85 races they all finished, they'd combined for a total of 83 in the points finishes or a 98% rate. Ultimately, the order would be Caroline, Piastri, and then Sargent, with the gap being 5.76 between the latter two. But there's more to that season than meets the eye. 
it was more or less a given that Caroline was going to get out to a strong start, seeing as though he was returning to the championship, and he certainly delivered, taking 8 of the first 10 wins. Meanwhile, it took Sargent 8 races to see the podium again, despite his previous season success capturing an 83% podium rate, with an average finish rate of 2.2 across 18 events. And the Thruxton events were Caroline's masterpiece, as he would pull off the historic triple. But with a little more than a third of the season in the books, Sargent smelled blood in the water, and the comeback was on. After amassing just 47 points in the first seven events, the rest of the season was superb. It was almost as if it was a new season entirely. In fact, if you were to split the championship after round seven, Sargent would be the British Formula 4 champion by two points over Caroline. And in this alternative scenario, he'd celebrate his maiden British F4 victory by taking control of the championship and maintaining the lead for the next seven consecutive races. And while that's not how motorsport works, it's certainly a powerful nuance to give a sense of a driver's progression. The 2017 finale saw his 10-point gap to runner-up Piastri disintegrate after starting in front of both Caroline and Piastri, only to suffer a gutting spin in the wet. The F4 British Championship, Alex Quinn on pole, Linus Lundqvist alongside then Logan Sargent and Jamie Caroline. So this could be enough for Sargent. Oh no, Sargent! He's Sargent, a... oh, what was we saying about counting points? And it wouldn't be the last time finale drama would come at the expense of a possible P2 in the championship. A couple of one-off Formula Renault appearances for Sargent in 2017 materialized into a full-time Formula Renault Euro Cup seat for 2018, where he'd again be up against a teammate who had experience competing in the championship, but this time in Max Futrell. The young Chinese driver Yi Fei would also be stiff competition all season, as his return to the series was coming off a PA classification in 2017. Sargent would be the highest scoring rookie in the 2018 season aside from Christian Lungard. The three drivers that finished above Sargent all hold ties to the Renault Sport Academy. And the start of the season for Sargent would be mixed full to the brim with highs and lows. He'd take victory on his first time out, followed promptly by a retirement in the second race at Paul Ricard. He won that first race of the season at Paul Ricard, and then he retired from the second race with a problem, which was uh, gearbox related. He was stacking gear. After a forgettable pair of results at Monza, he responded with a pair of runner-ups. But it was these next two rounds that would give Sargent a lot of work to do after the break. Headed into Monaco, he was actually only a point off fellow rookie Christian Lingard. And both were trailing FAA, sitting on 88 points, who had just, at this point, become the only Chinese driver to win a Formula Renault Euro Cup event. Sargent's single point haul from the Monte Carlo weekend was just the start of the issues. And the Red Bull ring wouldn't provide any hopes of a turnaround in the making. A double DNF here in the fifth round would make it all but impossible to return to the top three for the championship season. Through is there a problem for Logan Sargent, who is one of the front running drivers in the championship? It's been a little bit patchy recently for Logan Sargent after the terrific start. I suspect he's got a problem with the car. And there was one last race before the summer break at Spa. Sargent used that time to get one foot in the right direction with the podium, and thus ending his champagne less drought headed into the month long sabbatical on a high note. The only slight tailwind in Sargent's corner was that the grid found some trouble in rounds four and five, and the highest performer on points was Victor Martins, who was within touching distance after Spa. But Sargent found another level and really turned it on in the second half of the championship. Futrell was absolutely brilliant, taking 75% of maximum points and notching the same podium rate. Sargent's 118 point back half of the title race was good enough for second best, taking advantage of costly retirements from Lungard and Martins. FAA's consecutive Hockenheim podiums weren't enough to stop Futrell's incredible comeback which is impressive all by itself given the Chinese driver had control of the championship for 45% of the season. Lungard would be forced to relinquish his brief three-race stint atop the throne to a Futrell on fire who would take six consecutive podiums standing on the top step of half of those. And headed into the final rounds in Barcelona, the order was the following. And it was here the rookies rose to the occasion and did not squander their final shot at glory, as Sargent and Lungard would trade victories in both of the remaining events of the 2018 finale, each claiming a fastest lap in the process. With the final race in the books, Max Futrell would take the 2018 Formula Renault Euro Cup Championship. The battle was hotly contested, with Lungard having much of the momentum in the late part of the season, but the Danes' title hopes were ultimately dashed by his pair of late retirements. Futrell would beat out the field with 6 wins, 6 poles, and 18 points finishes. Sargent and Lungard would be identical on in the points finishes and DNFs at 17 and 3 respectively. And while the stat line captures a pair of pole positions for Sargent, it fails to appropriately register the fact that his eight group poles would only net those two overall pole positions on the season. And it was Lingard who rose above the field in top five finishes with 16 in total. And as such, he turned in the lowest average finish position of 3.4. The chapter closed on the 2018 season for Sargent with some what-if weekends in the early part of the season, but bookended by his victories. But onward and upward. Knowing what challenges were on the horizon, I bet he'd be hesitant to turn the page and advance to the next chapter. 
The 2019 season would mean a promotion to the newly formed FIA Formula 3 Championship, which was officially the convergence of GP3 and the FIA Formula 3 European Championship Series. This transition to the spec Delara F3 2019 chassis was a tough one for all of the Carlin drivers as the team would finish the season P9, avoiding dead last by outscoring Campos Racing 14-5. Sargent would be responsible for five of those points. When broken down further, the team would walk away with just six in the points finishes. Felipe Drugovic would pull in the largest points all for the team that season and his lone finish in the scoring range with an impressive P6 in Hungary, while Sargent would amass his five points across the four scoring finishes he scraped together this season. Prema would walk away with the title that season with Robert Schwartzman, Marcus Armstrong, and Jehan Daravala all finishing in succession at the top. Other Renault Euro Cup names would make a strong splash as Futrell took a couple of podiums and Longard would even snatch a win at the Hungaro ring. And after a fairly uneventful 2019 season, Sargent would need a spark plug to show the world that the results were real. If only there was a track that was so demanding that it essentially leveled the odds, there may be an outside shot to control the narrative and turn things around. And as it turns out, there was still business to attend to. And hello from Murray Walker and let me start by confidently predicting that this the 30th Macau Grand Prix is going to be the very best ever in the long history of this series. The iconic Macau Grand Prix, the ultimate test for an F3 driver, full of legendary moments. I think it's a very challenged circuit. Macau is where rivalries and legends are born. And this 2018 event would feature a switch from the Delara F317 over to the Delara F3 2018 cars. The 2018 field was jam-packed with some of the best young talent in the world, with many of these drivers well underway in their FIA Global Pathway progression. The Carlin team would field three cars, mixing in their promising rookie talent with a proven Macau veteran and double champion in Dan Tictum, who was looking to become the first driver to ever win the race three times in a row. And this would be a unique opportunity for any driver to prove themselves, as it would be the first time that the event would host all of the cars on the same chassis, engine power, and Pirelli rubber this time. If Sargent was to redeem himself from the tough 2018 season, there was no better stage to do it than Macau, a track known for being representative of F1 potential. If you have a bit experience and a good team, you can do a good job. Immediately, Macau showed it played no favorites and took no prisoners. One of the favorites of the event, Schwartzman would exit the track onto Lisboa runoff at the opening stage of the race after a clash with Lungard. Oh, oh it's no. Schwartzman, one of the favorites, and the champion is out on the first lap. And I have to say, that is the cruelty of Macau. Richard Vachor would take advantage of the opportunity as he broke free and brilliantly snatched B2, setting off for Yuri Vips, who had built a comfortable lead over one lap after a great race start. Side comes Vachor. Vachor's looking for a part in the party. And look at Richard Vachor. Richard Vachor, the Dutchman, is in second place. A superb start. But more trouble behind the leading pack as a safety car was brought out by incidents with Pochini and then Habsburg at the S's. The restart was all for sure all the way as he made his way around Vips for the lead. There's a chance here for Vashore, he comes alongside and pass, and that's great racing. Vashore getting alongside Yuri Vips and taking the lead of the Macau Grand Prix. Meanwhile, Sargent had a large job in front of him after his P6 start kept him in striking distance, but it was going to require a mighty effort to get on that podium. He was going to have to get around Lorandi as soon as possible and made that happen with seven laps to go. The next up was not going to be an easy overtake, and it was a driver he was familiar with. He had Christian Lingard now in his sights. As Vips and Vershore battled in the front pushing each other, he couldn't risk going wheel to wheel with Lingard for too long. The Dane had proven to be excellent at closing out races, so at the first opportunity, he had to take it. It was now or never. Vershore says no, and the battle for third place goes on, and Logan Sargent is up to third. Logan Sargent of the USA and Boca Raton in Florida has overtaken. Christian Lungard. And on that very next lap, with just six laps remaining, Sargent would get by Lungard and never look back. He'd end the race on the podium with a stellar P3 result. Sweet, sweet redemption. And this result couldn't have come at a more opportune time. It was absolutely mission critical he did this, and it was the catalyst for his 2020 season. But why is the result at Macau so important? Great question. Well, Macau is a stage that requires the best of every driver. Now, I know what you're thinking, Nick, that's stupid. Every circuit demands that. Well, just hear me out. The street circuit sanctions both auto and motorcycle racing over the course of the weekend. It was first run as an amateur event until Mauro Bianchi would run his Alpine chassis with technical support to a 1966 victory. This exploded the interest from other professional Grand Prix teams to put their drivers and tech to the ultimate test. The event transitioned to host F3 races with Ayrton Senna taking the inaugural F3 feature title championship in 1983. It acts as a natural mental reset, setting things back to zero. And this has always been a critical element as to why you see drivers who may not be on full support packages from academies or drivers who may have lagged in the championship that same year break through at Macau. 
And speaking of the Bianchi lineage, grandson of Mauro, Jules Bianchi, whose godson, Charles Leclerc, serves as the quintessential example of this in his 2015 European F3 performance. In the last nearly half of the season from round 15 on, the future Ferrari man would only score 86 points, just under a quarter of his entire year's tally. He'd ultimately end up a distant fourth behind Rosenquist and Giovinazzi well in front of Stroll, Russell, and Albon. He didn't set foot on the podium that entire stint. But Macau was a different story. And don't take it from me, here's what Leclerc said about the event after he would go on to take P2 at Macau. And he wasn't just blowing smoke about this helping him into the next season with his momentum. He'd go on to win consecutive titles in GP3 and then in F2. The Macau boost is very real indeed. And fortunately for Sargent, he was about to find out just how real it was. And to truly set the stage for one of the most exciting championships I've seen in a long while, let's take a step back and get some perspective. Going back to Leclerc, well, that's obviously a household name for many single-seater motorsport fans. He had to start somewhere, though. And the deeper I looked into the archives of junior racing history, the more instances I found of lower form of the performance delivering a strong result at Macau and then progressed through the ranks of F2, ultimately concluding with at least a test in F1. But what was the underlying trend? Is it bona fide or is this a glitch in the data? And as per usual, let's take a deep dive into the history and all of the numbers, shall we? I'll keep this segment to just the past decade, otherwise we'd literally be here forever. And as I went one layer deeper, I found the commonality of some sort of a title battle in F3, a top three finish, let's call it. Here are all of the drivers who have claimed both a top three at Macau, as well as a top three finish in F3 to their name, and what they've gone on to do in motorsports, again, all the past decade. The only two drivers that I found on this list to have success at F3, as well as Macau, and not go on to F1, were Joel Erickson and Felix Rosenquist. Ericsson was backed by BMW and it was reported he had money and a seat lined up to support an F2 drive, but decided to go to DTM. Given BMW's involvement in other series like GT and DTM, there was a fair bit of logic to support his decision using hindsight. He was able to land a development driver role in Formula E with Dragon in 2020. And as for Felix Rosenquist, he was one of the more versatile drivers I've ever seen race. It's another example of a driver who had the results, but didn't advance to F2. The Swede is one of the more successful F3 drivers in the history of the series, but it came down to, at least in small part, the massive funding package needed to fuel an F2 drive. He is joined by his compatriot and ex-Formula 1 driver, Marcus Ericsson, at Chip Ganassi and IndyCar. I want to introduce Felix Rosenquist. He'll be the driver of the 7 car next year and, and beyond. So really excited, obviously, to have him uh, as part of our team. <laughs> and go ahead and scratch that. For the 2021 season, he'll be with Aero McLaren SP. You get the picture though. And while there are very rare exceptions, the general trend seems to hold true. A Macau podium plus a title battle in F3 will drum up support for an F2 drive where racecraft and pace really can start to show. So what's the catch? Why are we here? Sargent has proved thus far to be a race winner and has a strong pedigree in junior series racing. And if you judge his career up until the 18th of November 2019, there'd still be some room to wonder where his potential really is. And at the end of 2019, he still lacked a title battle in a series without brandishing the rookie title. Being a self-funded racing driver on the FIA global ladder has its limits, and at some point, you do have to catch a break. The stars have to align, and when they do, your best foot better be forward. And then, Christmas came early. Hi guys, my name is Logan Sargent. I'm from America, and I'm racing with Prema in FIF3. Sargent was the first driver confirmed on the defending champion Prema squad for the 2020 season, as all three previous drivers would be rewarded with F2 drives for the 2019 showing. It was now his turn to commence his own redemption tour, but it wouldn't be a walk in the park. He'd be joined by a very familiar name he's raced throughout his entire career, Oscar Piastri. Making the challenge even more difficult was Prummer welcoming another F3 newcomer and this time another defending champion in Frederick Vesti. With the storylines all laid out and the stakes all well explained, it's time for the main event. To battle they go, and on to the 2020 season we follow. Round 1. The Red Bull Ring. It would be none of the Prema drivers on pole for the first race, but the theatrics were well underway. One turn into the much anticipated Prema battle and there was contact for Piastri. Piastri with him into P2, not the start of Fernandez needing close to contact. There is contact, and the pole sits and spins round to go to the back of the. He'd rework himself back into position, take the lead, and keep it for the win in round one, with Sargent and Peroni filling out the podium. And over the next three rounds, Vesti would be the most efficient driver, taking 33 points, but he'd hit a major rough patch in Hungary, turning in two retirements over the course of the weekend. And over the same period, we would get a glimpse, though, of what Sauber Jr. driver Teo Pochera was capable of, as he would do what no driver did all season long. He would take consecutive wins. The first win would come at the Red Bull ring with the leading pair taking each other out, and then he'd claim the top step of the podium at the future race in Hungary. 
and these were massive points for the French driver representing ART, as Prema as a team would only produce 48 points at the Hungara ring, with Piastri responsible for 67% of those. Heading into Silverstone, Piastri held a comfortable 26 point lead over Sargent, with Porsche and P3 pulling within 2 points of the American. Historically, Sargent has given some incredible results at the circuit that plays host to the Formula 1 British Grand Prix, but his previous year's pointless weekend at Silverstone wasn't exactly taking him into the weekend on a high. But that was then, and this is now, and he's going to need something better to stay in this fight. It was time to deliver. Yeah, that's how we do it. Yes, yes. Logan Sargent is the new championship leader. Good job, mate. Well done. Of the nine feature races, only on three occasions all season was pole position converted to a race win. Vesti was the first to accomplish this in round two, with Zendeli also joining the list with an impressive showing at Spa. Sargent would return to his normal Silverstone form, claiming pole position at both events, and then was the first driver to cross the finish line in the event that took place over the weekend that F1 was celebrating its 70th year anniversary. And thus, he joined the list of three drivers that would take 29 points in a single race. The number three car would be the class of the field amongst the top title contenders, taking 56 points over those two races, with Vesti taking 33, Piastri earning 29, and Porsche taking 21. Liam Lawson would have an incredible recovery after a nightmare string of three straight retirements to rack up 45 points at Silverstone. And it was at this point in the season that the other drivers started to punish the top drivers leaving the door open. Spain saw JQs take his one and only victory of the season, Liam Lawson would join him on the podium, and Matteo Nanini would take his first podium of the season in the next race. And in that next round at Spa, Piastri would go five points clear Sargent taking the championship lead back, which would motivate Sargent propel him back to take a race win. That P1 would give him enough points to take the championship right back from Piastri. Vesti would take P2 at the second race at Spa, followed up by Liam Lawson. We now have a new championship leader in Logan Sargent and just four races to go to find out whether he will take the title. The Temple of Speed, Monza. Prima secured the team championship as the F3 grid went to Italy for the final two rounds at Monza and Mugello. But that didn't stop the drama as the championship battle would blow past heating up and fully boil over. And the pendulum swings again in the points battle! Both Piastri and Sargent would each have consecutive rounds of pointless scoring lines, and it would prove to be the most painful for Sargent, as he would lose the championship lead after the weekend from hell at Monza, where he'd squabble with Piastri for mid-range points for much of the opening stint, only to be caught up in traffic. Here come the championship contenders battling over 8th place, Piastri gets past Logan Sargent once again. And while battling back from P9, he'd make a pass on Clement Novelak, heading into the chicane and get a bumper tap that would eliminate his chances of scoring. His second Monza showing was equally unfulfilling, finishing 24th for an average P25 at the home of Formula 1's Italian Grand Prix. But for a brief moment there, it appeared that Sargent got a gift from the racing gods. Lap 10, the tension was still high with Hughes and Lawson swabbing for race lead and a display of awesome driving from the pair as they exited the chicane cleanly. But after that, carnage. Oh, round goes the championship leader! Round goes the championship leader! Oscar Piastri involved in that! And the pendulum swings again in the points battle! Piastri, who now owned the championship lead, mind you, saw his race come to an end first as he was dealt the same fate as Sargent got from Novalak just 24 hours previously. And on lap 17, Vesti's bold pass on his teammate paid dividends, and Sargent not defending too hard, understanding there's more play than just this one position. But Vesti understandably knows that his rival has to think about the championship. But Sargent did well to avoid any contact, as Vesti had locked up, going deep into the breaking zone. A couple laps later, and Sargent would look to cash in on the courtesy he paid his teammate with some very generous defending. And as we see here, lap 19, Sargent is making the pass pretty easily on Vesti. Looks like they have an understanding. Sargent is going on to take the championship lead, run away with it pretty comfortably, and he... Oh. Oh, no. No. And in one swift, monumental miscommunication, just like that, the championship has changed dramatically. Piastri would find himself bringing home no points after inheriting the championship lead, but his troubles began with that Monza incident and was capped off by a P11 in Mugello's feature race. And keep in mind, this would all coincide perfectly with the other two Prima drivers walking away with no points after getting tangled up. But all the while, there was this one driver that all the drivers at the top seemed to forget about. And as they ruthlessly battled for that championship, it was Teo Pocher who was just biding his time, waiting for the opportunities, doing his job, striking when he could. And his recent calm, cool, and collected form would help him claw his way back into the hunt. It wasn't even until Spa that he would actually break 100 points. Well, kind of. He matched 100 on the nose. And in those final six events, Porsche was superb, leading the entire field, taking a whopping 81 points, compared to just 34 for Piastri and only 29 for Sargent. The highest producer of the Prima Pack was Vesti. While he found himself just outside of contention for most of the season, 
His two wins and three podiums were good enough for 76 points and were a massive boost to his final classification in the championship. On to Mugello. Zendeli alleviates some of the pressure by taking his second pole in just three races, and the field gets away cleanly. Porsche cleverly hops up on the pit lane exit to overtake Sargent, whom he trails by 17 at this point to demote the American driver back to his starting position of P5. Resti overtakes Zendeli for P2 on lap 15 with the help of DRS, and he makes quick work of Hughes for the race lead a couple of laps later. And over the course of just two laps, Sargent swaps places with Fittipaldi and back again to P5. Enzo would save his final move for the last lap theatrics that infected the entire grid, which would have major ramifications on the championship. On lap 21, three critical things happened. And they happened so fast, let's slow it down. Number one, Vesti overtook Hughes for the race win. Number two, Porsche traded up into the final podium spot with Sindeli again. And number three, Sargent would be demoted to P6 by Fittipaldi. In hindsight, this brilliant last lap maneuver would be a gutting blow after the events of the title finale. Vesti's win left him 17 and a half points adrift from the championship title, so not mathematically out of contention, given just one race ago, the remaining Prima drivers left Monza without a single point. Piastri's championship lead is once again eliminated to nil. Both Sargent and Piastri now sit on 160 points. Porsche has climbed his way all the way to P3 on 151 points. Vesti in P4 now has 142 and a half points. So at the top of the championship sits two rivals who have been battling basically their entire career, with each season them outdoing each other and once again they are deadlocked, each having opportunities to seemingly put the championship away over the last couple races. But you've also now got to recognize the charging young Frenchman who's on the rise. He's now just 9 points back for a potential dark horse victory. You couldn't make this stuff up. Who was going to rise at the occasion? Better yet, who was going to avoid catastrophe? Three drivers now have a viable shot at being crowned king of the grid of a nerve-testing title that has shown they all possess a champion spirit. A final race decider for the championship of Formula 3. The Finale Lawson leads the pack, followed closely by Beckman, who has to defend the inside. This leaves the door open for Fernandez around the outside. But it's Lawson's excellent defending that forces Beckman to take door number two and switch to the outside so he himself doesn't lose any more positions as ART's Smallyer is forced to react to Sargent slashing to attack around the outside. He defends the number three car successfully, but realizes he needs to leave room for his teammate Fernandez, who is returning to the racing line from getting a bit too wide in his overtake attempt of Lawson, kicking up dust as he hops on the curb. Beckman and Smallyer go wheel to wheel, making very slight contact, but recovering nicely into the left flick with Sindeli and Sargent, the latter now on the inside, aiming to do the same and make a clean exit. But they've now got a major problem. Fernandez is attempting to take the apex after rejoining from his deep turn, making it three cars into the turn, which is probably one too many. Sargent and Zindeli have accounted for the proper space and all looks clean, but Fernando squeezes Sargent more and more. You've got a situation that looks a lot like the 2017 Singapore Grand Prix, where Fernandez has no way to see that they are already two cars deep. Sargent has absolutely nowhere to go. He's totally boxed in. He can't yield to an encroaching Fernandez even if he felt the threat of contact, given he knew Zindeli was on the right. Because, keep in mind, he's got Fittipaldi right there in his wheel tracks. And Zindeli can't move for the right, sensing Logan is being pushed his way or he'll be forced wide off the track. If Sargent and Zindeli are able to make the exit cleanly, Sargent is going to have a bit of space as he'll have the racing line ahead of Zindeli before the right flick and able to set off after Beckman and Smolier. This would put Porsche a full four cars back and the remaining Prima drivers paired up six cars back. If results held there for Sargent in P4, he'd earn 12 points in the final round. So long as Porsche didn't make up those positions and pass him, he'd have held on to the lead that he entered the race with over the French driver. Vesti had the slight advantage over Piastri at that point, so in that scenario, if results held, Sargent would have taken the title. Not even a lap in, his title hopes have dissipated. Even if Piastri fails to score, he'd lose the title on countback in the event of a 160-point tie. And that's assuming Porsche can't finish with any considerable amount of points, which isn't that likely given his latest form. Not to mention, with the fastest lap still at play for two points and 20 laps remaining, well, anything could happen. On lap 16, the championship inches one step closer to being crystallized as Porsche clinches at minimum P2 in the championship if results hold, overtaking for P3 on track. He'd now be sitting on 161 points. But not to be outdone, Piastri simultaneously passes Smallyer for P9, which would give him the go-ahead title if these results hold as he sits on 162 points currently. 
and for a handful of seconds, Porsche's P3 and 10 points technically made him champion with 161 points in the books. But that's only because Piastri has yet to cross the line. He had his three points all but locked up for the inevitable win. He made a late break dashing for the line to Pip Smolier's ART for P7 for good measure, which gave him four points on the day. After the dust was settled, the ART F3 rookie had done enough to move a single point clear of Sargent for runner-up in the championship. The four points amassed by Piastri were enough to take the F3 championship title, just three points clear of Porsche and four points clear of Sargent. Liam Lawson, David Beckman, Jake Hughes, and Liram Zindeli all ended the season in phenomenal form, pushing the drivers at the top, making this a true test of metal. In the end, it was Piastri's consistency that pushed him ahead and his ability to avoid catastrophic race results. He turned in an average race classification of 4.75 compared to 6.87 and 8.06 for Vesti and Sargent, respectively. And this is supported by the single out-of-points finish he'd produce in the feature race of the final round. Vesti's efforts would garner two out-of-points finishes, one of them from the incident with Sargent, and three DNFs on the year. And as for Sargent, he'd have two additional out-of-points finishes on top of the Vesti contact, failing to classify on two occasions, the most notable the championship finale. Piastri and Sargent would be deadlocked at nine top five finishes apiece. They'd also match each other on podiums at six respectively, with Vesti trailing marginally in both categories. However, Vesti would lead the team in wins, impressively with all three coming in the feature race. Sargent and Piastri would split down the middle each of their wins between race one and race two. As such, Vesti would have the bulk of his points, 76% of them, coming from the feature race, followed closely by Sargent at 68% and Piastri at 65% and it was Sargent's qualifying performance that really stood out amongst the entire grid. He would earn pole championship, taking a third of all pole positions available throughout the 2020 season, and in doing so, he'd have an average grid start of P3. And for the answer team battle, Sargent would lead qualifying for Prema on six occasions. More than Vesti would lead the team, which was twice, and Piastri topping the Prema qualifying charts once in the opening round. He'd also never be out-qualified by both of his teammates over the course of the season, and on the few occasions he was off his teammates in quali, he'd boast the smallest gap to whomever was leading at just a tenth off on average. And comparatively, Piastri and Vesti would be 0.4 seconds off the leading from a driver on average. So each driver walked away with something to show for their efforts, some spots shining brighter than others. Last year's top six drivers were promoted to the F2 championships, but that doesn't mean this is always going to be the case. The commonality among the 2019 top six class is they represented academy affiliations across Ferrari, Red Bull, and the Renault programs. This seems to be the source behind some of the action of the 2020 top contenders and the action they saw in the offseason, and it couldn't be more deserved. The F3 champion Piastri would get his time in F1 machinery at Bahrain and a spec RS18 as a part of Renault's junior testing program. Lungard would lead the juniors and Guan Yu Zhou would wrap things up November 2nd. This happens to be one of the main benefits of having the muscle of a driver program behind you. You are afforded the opportunity to showcase your talent and increasingly more powerful machinery to move closer to securing the most prestigious seat in single-seater racing. But without that alignment, it's difficult to prove to the world what you are capable of. Even having the guidance of compatriots who have been there and done that opens a lot of doors, if not just psychologically. In understanding the importance of these academies, how does a driver successfully navigate this world? And how does a driver from a non-traditional background actually get access to these sorts of resources? Is it even possible? And rather than sit here and have me speculate, I figured I'd actually talk to someone who's been there and done that. And if you remember earlier from this video, Jamie Caroline has actually dealt with this before. I tossed the question to him. Just like anything, money talks and you can get on them that way. But I mean, a lot of people nowadays are getting scouted through karting. If they've got the right people behind them with the right connections, they can, you know, utilize success they've had in karting and give them, you know, a platform to build on in cars. Because like you said, like Logan is obviously hasn't got one of them platforms. I didn't have one at the time. Um, I obviously had talks with, with teams, but I just didn't have the funding to progress to Europe, which is what every um, you know junior academy wanted. And I, didn't, um, I unfortunately didn't have that. Given the contents of this story, the unique intersection of him being familiar with Sargent and the fact that he's a professional driver, I thought Jamie would be a perfect person to ask, well, what should Sargent do next? It's a hard one. Um, you know, a lot of it's timing orientated yeah. as well. You've got to wait for the right time. You've got to wait for a space to free up. You know, I've known him for a few years. I know how good he is and I know how fast he is, but he just doesn't quite have lady luck on his side, which yeah. probably hasn't, obviously hasn't helped him, you know, young driver program wise. Because um, it does, it is a bit of luck involved as well. Obviously, you make your own luck, but Logan is probably a little bit faster. Um, one lap pace wise and that showed you know with Logan's qualifiers this year and the amount of poles he had but I think you know I do think Logan has improved in, in all areas and I think you know he's really upped his game from last year with Carlin but um, you know he really wanted it this year and he just didn't quite have, have luck on his side 
but that doesn't necessarily make it impossible without that alignment. And in this situation, I defer to someone I would consider the expert. So who better to talk to than the brains behind none other than the F1 feeder series? Logan Sargent and Junior Academies. Um, yeah, that's an interesting story. Uh, so far, he uh, has no affiliation with any F1 team. Um, of course, he's driving for Prima, and Prima has um, like a relationship with Ferrari, but nothing has come of that yet. Should he even go to a junior academy, or should he do it on his own, as he has been doing now? Junior academy has its advantages, of course, but mainly they consist of facilities um, and expertise of a Formula One team. Think of uh, top-notch simulators, training facilities, and even maybe PR training. But yeah, the funding, that is that is not a part of it. People think that, uh, for, for example, when you sign with Red Bull, they pay your way to F1. And that is a pretty common misconception. But F2 requires big money to race, and even more important, the right relationships to get a piece of Formula One machinery in your hands. But the conversation didn't stop there. I also wanted to know what he thought the chances for Sargent to enter Formula 1 were. First on, you have Red Bull. If you sign up for Red Bull, you're basically putting your future in Helmut Marko's hands. Um, and while it will be a driver's best bet, uh, as they have no, almost no drivers with a super license, um, yeah, it also uh, is your worst bet. So if you take a look at Yuri Vips, you know, he was uh, first, uh, everybody thought he was going to go to F2 and then to F1. They decided uh, it was better for him to go to Super Formula. He went to Formula Regional, but missed a couple of races. And basically his whole season now is over. And now he's seeing Yuki Tsunoda, who went to Formula 2 and is probably almost 100% certain driving for Alpha Tauri in 2021. So that's, that's uh, you know, it's a risky option. You give away almost all your rights. Um, and I don't think he wants to do that. Well, then you have Mercedes. They don't really have an academy to speak of. They, of course, you know of Ocon, but he had to sit at the sidelines because they didn't have a place for him. Look at George Russell. Uh, he's now stuck for two, three years at Williams. So do you really want to go there and put a pause on your dreams and hopes of reaching F1 uh, and hope that maybe in the future uh, Hamilton retires, Bottas retires, etc. But yeah, it doesn't seem like a very good bet. Then you have McLaren. Um, they currently don't have any junior drivers and they have, of course, a link with the United States. If they would be serious about uh, setting up a junior academy, um, maybe that would be an interesting move. Also, of course, because of the affiliation with the IndyCar. So if he doesn't make it to F1, there's always that pathway to, to IndyCar. And then maybe his best bet, Ferrari, but they have already, I think, maybe nine drivers in the program. But, like I told you earlier, they have the uh, affiliation with Prima, he's in Prima, so if he goes to F2 and he has a good year, like a good rookie year, and maybe he can even stay on par with like somebody like Robert Schwarzman, who's, who's probably going to do another year, then he would have you know, reasonably good chances to, to, to make it to F1. And of course, um, the main advantage of the Ferrari Driver Academy is that Ferrari has uh, Alfa Romeo, of course, and uh, Haas, where they have places sort of now, for instance, uh, Mick Schumacher will go to Haas, of course. So yeah, if one of those junior drivers doesn't have a very good 2021 20, and Logan Sargent, you know, has a very good year, who knows, he'll be in F1 in 2022. Maybe the most interesting option and actually the most logical one is just keep on doing what he's doing now, not affiliated to a junior academy. If he keeps doing what he's doing, you know, besides his, uh, I think it was his 2019 year with Carlin, uh, besides that, uh, he's just been doing stellar. He had a very good second year in FIA F3, although his, I have to say, his, his teammates were, of course, rookies, uh, Oscar Piastri and uh, Frederick Vesti. Sargent had some bad luck uh, for instance of course the most famous one is in the last race when he got squeezed and had to retire from the race and actually because of that he probably lost the title yeah all in all i think his best bets are the ferrari driver academy but they would have to want him and he would have one to go and if he doesn't you know he can still make it on his own he's maybe the biggest bet for americans for him to reach f1 and while F2 does cost a pretty penny for everyone up and down the grid, a history of results can mean return on investment. And this starts as early as karting. 
and Nico's talked about this as he's built his karting team. Uh, so that's the opportunity, you know, if you then nationally show that you got the talent, then on the international level there's a lot of people who will be supporting sponsors, teams and everything, because it's a business in the end, you know, and they need to win. But this trend certainly isn't bucked after karting. But as Nico said, karting and pretty much all of racing share that commonality. At the end of the day, it really is all a business first. Top drivers are needed to make any investment in a seat worth the return. This is exponentially more true in Formula One. Logan Sargent remains one of the more decorated junior drivers that falls outside the affiliation of an academy team. As such, as of the time making this video, he's one of the very small handful of talented drivers in the past decade who have achieved a podium at Macau as well as being involved in an F3 title battle, finishing at least in the top three and not advanced to Formula 2. I'm notoriously against using the word deserve in this sport. A Grand Prix circuit holds no grudges, it plays no favorites. I don't know what's going to come of any of these junior drivers' careers. But I know the Formula 1 grid has a bright future so long as the flame stays lit for the dreams of these F1 hopefuls. And I found just the right person who I think said it best, and I couldn't agree more. Yeah, to Logan, I, I can't imagine how you're feeling right now, man. Like, you just never want to see that, and I'm, I'm sorry it had to end that way. I would have loved to fight to the death. Looking forward to probably racing them again in the years to come. For now, as I see it, all we can do is hope that the 2020 champ was right and they all get a chance to fight this one out again another day. Thanks for checking out Sargent's story. Subscribe for more F1 stories like it and share with a friend if I earned it. And I'll see you very, very soon. If you achieved getting to Formula One, do you think you could match maybe Lewis Hamilton or Sebastian Vettel's four titles or even Michael's? Well, we're far away away from that, but um, hopefully, yeah, we'll see. You must think about it though. Teenagers always think about stuff like this, don't they? Yeah, of course, but it's a long way away. So.